everybody? Welcome into Tom Cameron's Patriots Talk Podcast, day one of the Patriots mandatory minicamp. The last stage of the real off season is underway. The Patriots got together on this Tuesday in June, and Phil Perry is alongside to break down some of the observations. Phil, I think it's important to remind people minicamp is non-evaluation, non-competition. Really, to me, I look at it as it's an orientation for what the first week of training camp is going to look like. Agreed? Yeah, I would say, though, that it is a little bit ratcheted up in terms of the intensity than the first two OTA practices that we were at. They're not walkthroughs. You're right. Yeah, so you're, you're getting more um, – you're really not getting full speed, but I would say you're getting more competitive – offense on defense types of drills. So seven on seven or 11 on 11, you are seeing things occasionally where I'll give you, for instance, the last play of practice today where Terrence Mitchell is on Nelson Aguilar. Nelson Aguilar has a pass, hit his hands. Mitchell gets a little over aggressive for the spring. I would say, I would say he was at the, he was a toe over the line and that's it out of Aguilar's hands. And then guys are going after the ball. Like it's a fumble. Like he wouldn't, I don't think he would have seen that the first couple of practices we were at. So there was a little bit more intensity today, but it it really is not at training camp level yet. You're right. Yeah, just to tie it off using that play as an example, the players are in shorts and jerseys, no pads, helmets, obviously. And on that particular play, just to bring it full circle with some of the new guys involved, on that play, Matthew Judon ended up scooping the ball, whether it's a fumble or not a fumble. But as he scooped it, in came Cole Strange, the rookie who's well-known for his aggressiveness, trying to dive on the ball and scoop it. And he banged into the shin, didn't really fold over Matthew Judon. But that, of course, attracted attention from both teams. It was not a melee. It was not a Donnybrook. It was not even a set two. It was just a little bit of, hey, 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 hey. But that was the last play of practice. Phil, what do we glean from practice, beginning with the coaching staff scrutiny that we've been putting on? So I thought there was a little bit of a change there, and it's a change that makes sense to me uh, if things are trending in the direction that that we've been hearing they've been trending, meaning Matt Patricia was more involved. So in previous practices that we had had access to, Matt Patricia was – with the offensive line throughout the practice when the offense got together for 11-on-11 stuff, if it was a run game period, Matt Patricia would give Mac Jones the call. He'd bring it into the huddle. Today, Patricia was more involved in a variety of different periods where he was giving plays to Mac Jones. So he was still... the Joe Judge kind of, right? Right. So here's the difference. He was still with the offensive line when the quarterbacks and the pass catchers were doing seven on seven stuff. So Matt Patricia did a different corner of the field for that. But when they went 11 on 11, Joe judge sort of stepped to the side. Matt Patricia took on what looked like the play caller role. Although I would say that changed a little bit at the end of practice where both Patricia and Joe judge stepped aside and Bill Belichick was your play caller at the end of practice for one period. So uh, I thought Patricia was more involved. And again, the reporting from Mike Reese and Jeff Howe has been that it's trending in the direction that Matt Patricia will be the play caller. And I would say today was the first time we saw in person some steps toward that ultimate result. We also saw Bill Belichick in a <laughs> in an interesting role today. And he was early in practice wearing a red beanie on his 70-year-old head and going in motion to um, – imitate a, a slot receiver later in the practice. Phil said he's snapping in the quarterback <laughs> drill. Phil was uh, shotgun snapping to Mac Jones and then popping up. Like he was a latter day, Damani Dawson, Dwight Stevenson looking for anybody to block. So hands on in a number of different ways, as opposed to previously, he was with the offense completely. Phil, he looked like more of a supervisory making sure everything is, the way he wants it. Again, as they finish up their off season and give these guys an idea of what we're going to be doing when we get to the first week of training camp, which as we've talked about is often seen as the a continuation of mini camp. Right. And, and I would say compared to other years, 
especially recently when Josh McDaniels has been able to to really run the show offensively. Um, Bill Belichick, I think, is still more involved offensively. You know, what we saw from him today, I think, qualifies as more involved on the offensive side, but he was less involved than the two previous practices we'd been to. He, he did spend time with the defense. He did spend time with special teams. He did spend time at midfield with, I think it might have been Moses Cabrera, the head strength and conditioning coach. Instead of being right by Joe Judge's side and watching a, a receiver slash quarterback drill, he was 40 yards away, arms folded, just kind of taking it all in. So I, I think he was a little more hands-off today, Tom, as compared to a couple practices where the way we were describing it, I think, was you know, he's almost like the principal sitting in the back of the room while the teacher was up front teaching the lesson. You know, he was he was more hands off today, trying to give I think trying to give Judge and probably Patricia too um, a little more ownership of what was going on on that side of the ball. Phil, do you think the Patriots are changing their offense in a drastic way? Are signs pointing to that in your mind? Here's why I have difficulty answering answering that question. The Patriots offense is, as we know it, is the most varied offense maybe in the history of football. <laughs> With Tom Brady, they ran two-back offense. They ran two-tight end offense. They ran spread in 2007. They have run zone concepts in their running game. They have run gap concepts in their running game. They have, they have done everything. Mm -hmm. They had everything at their disposal which was great for them, especially when you had a supercomputer, a quarterback, and an a incredibly bright offensive coordinator and Josh McDaniels and those guys working together. What I think might happen, though, this year and moving forward, Tom, is that they just pare down. I, I think so, you have to, almost. I think they're – I don't know if – so is that a drastic change or do they just pick things from a couple different years and say this is what will probably be good at this year so we don't need to go into this year with everything. Mm -hmm. Right. But we want to have the ability to do a few different things really, really well. I think that might be happening. So the notion of streamlining that, you know, Kendrick Bourne talked about some new verbiage and we've heard the word streamlining the offense. Bill Belichick talked about, hey, this is the type of thing that happens. And I think we all would understand that it, it's a good time to do it. If a play call is 32Y over smash, mesh, mesh, whatever, just call it 32 over. If the all, you know, if that gets covered by everything. And again, I don't know what the frig I'm talking about. But this is a uh, a good point at which to streamline and reboot the offense and toss out some things and change the way you're going to refer to things. I don't think that Josh, excuse me, the Matt Jones is going to have any great difficulty processing what's going on. I mean, he came into the NFL and was more apt to understand what the Patriots offense was, was all about than Cam Newton, who had been in the, the offense the year before, you know, forgetting about the Alabama carryover that he had. But it just he's he's a sharp guy. And if Patricia, who was a rocket scientist, is a sharp guy, and Joe Judge isn't a, a dummy, they should be able to master it, especially if you're paring it down and going from a 300-level class down to a 100 in terms of terminology. So I, I don't think that's going to be a big deal. But I was talking to Kyrie Thompson from WEEI, had been at Boston.com, and he was asking me, what do you think the offense is going to look like? And he kept looking at you know the, the edge runs and the zone runs to the outside. And I'm like, ah, I wouldn't put a lot of stock in that. They might be working on something that they're not good at, that they have to get good at. Maybe they've already done the inside stuff. They know how to do this. So don't, so don't make too many conclusions. But the more I thought about it, if the Patriots are going to jettison their fullback the way they did, and they're going to feature Jonu Smith, and they're going to do some more zone concepts, perhaps, could the Patriots' simplification, Phil, be borrowing from the San Francisco 49ers? Wouldn't that be something that would be helpful to, to Mac Jones? I think so. And this is something the accuracy, that I said, the drag stuff, all that shit. Well, this is what I said when it looked like Jared Stidham might be their starting quarterback is you have to make this as quarterback friendly as you can. And the best example of the most quarterback friendly offense that we know in the modern NFL is the Shanahan style offense. So whether you're seeing it in San Francisco or in Los Angeles with Sean McVay or in Tennessee or in Green Bay now where Aaron Rodgers has sort of been taken to another level thanks to some of these types of concepts, it's working everywhere. And it's turning somebody like Jimmy Garoppolo, who I think we all would acknowledge is a pretty average NFL quarterback in terms of talent, and turning him into statistically 
one of the most impressive quarterbacks in football when he's on the field. I mean, some of his numbers are outstanding. Mm -hmm. Why is that? In part, I think it's a lot of scheme. A lot of it is catch and run. A lot of it is surrounding him with good gut, with uh, good talent. But Tom, there's no doubt. I mean, it turned Jared Goff into a Super Bowl quarterback, not a Super Bowl winning quarterback, but it, it got them there. Matt Ryan became an MVP after after being good to Pro Bowl to MVP. I've, I, this is the argument I've always made: is that that offense takes you up a level. If you're Matt Schaub and you're slightly below average, it can take you to average or even good. If you're Matt Ryan, it can take you from good to MVP. It's it's it just works. It, that's that's the evidence that we have. And so I thought they should have done it if Jared Stidham had ended up being the quarterback, which obviously he wasn't. But it would make a lot of sense to me now if they. They tried to incorporate a lot of that stuff, and we have been seeing those types of runs. I don't know. Again, to your point, I don't know why exactly. Maybe it's because they suck at it. Maybe it's just because there's no pads and it's easier to practice zone runs as opposed to downhill gap scheme, pulling guards and hitting linebackers types of runs. Mm -hmm. But that would be a fascinating change if they were to. And again, that sort of stuff, Tom, has been in the playbook. But if they start to emphasize it and they build their offense around those concepts, that would be interesting to me, and I think it could really help them. All right. Correct me if I'm wrong as I try and explain to folks who might be wondering, all right, what exactly does this mean? If you watch the Patriots last year, most of their runs were between – the most successful runs especially were between the guards, whether it be right up the middle behind the center or the guard center holes on either side, those gaps. Um, they weren't very successful at running outside partially because of the backs, partially whatever. They just were better and more adept at running interior. That's the downhill runners they had. The Shanahan-style offense, and we are referencing Kyle, but it really began with Mike, is it's a zone run. So the offensive line starts to move outside, and they start sealing defensive linemen and linebackers in succession, walling them off. And the running back is supposed to, at some point, See a hole, put his foot in the ground. If he's running to the right, he's going to put his right foot in the ground and he's going to get his shoulders parallel to the end zone in front of him and go up field as far as and as fast as he can. So it's a one cut style. You remember it from Terrell Davis. Google it, you'll see it. The offense, the, the passing game off of that oftentimes revolves around bootleg, which is you fake the zone run, stand up tall. And then you have receivers dragging the other way across the field at different depths. The linebacker depth, it's a safety depth, there's a deep depth, depth, and they're all different timing on them. And you're basically picking. Jake Plummer was a really good quarterback for Mike Shanahan running this offense. So, also, when you look at the Patriots personnel, Johnny Smith can be a little George Kittley, if not Hunter Henry could be. I mean, you know, Kittle's great. Maybe Kendrick Bourne can be a little bit Debo samuel -y. They have a good complement of running backs, the same way the Atlanta Falcons did. Phil, I want you to pick up the ball and 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 go with it where you will, because I'm sure that you got thoughts now. Well, and they have some. I you know I think they have when they're all healthy. I think they have athletic offensive linemen. You know, the one guy that you would look at and say, "Ooh, that doesn't look like a doesn't look like a zone guard to me," is Mike Wenu, because he's 350 pounds. And he's not a freak athlete the way Trent Brown at 400 pounds is. Trent Brown is 400 pounds. Or, is Trent you know, Brown too big to run that kind of offense? He And I that's another so. note we'll have is Trent Brown was working at left and Isaiah went at right. But we'll get to that. Yeah, and this, this actually meshes with the Trent Brown-Isaiah Wynn conversation a little bit to me. And this is hypothesizing on my part. And I would like to reach out to some folks I know in the league who, who might be able to give me better insight on this. Um. But to answer your question first, I don't think he's too big because I think he moves well enough. This is a guy who, you know, can windmill dunk at 6'8", 400 pounds. Like, he's he's just a specimen. So, uh, and David Andrews is a good athlete at center. Cole Strange was primarily a zone, was a guard for a zone running team at UT Chattanooga. And a great athlete, a real impressive athlete when you look at some of his, his testing numbers and you just watch him play. Um, Isaiah Wynn is a good athlete as well, you know, relative to your average offensive lineman. So I think they have the personnel to do it. Um, Tom brings up the Trent Brown storyline because we saw Trent Brown at left tackle today and Isaiah Wynn at right tackle today. It was the first practice we'd been at where both guys had been present and they swapped from where they were last year. Why is that? My 
very, very early, I'm wondering if kind of theory is when you have a right-handed quarterback and if you're running zone running plays and you want to boot off of those at the risk, I'm about to get out of my chair and try to show this visually. I won't, but (laughs) if you want to run, run, run to eventually sell the play action boot off of that, number one, you want to run behind your best run blocking tackle, which would be Trent Brown to me over Isaiah Wynn. But so you're going to be running to the offensive left. And and why would you switch then Brown? Why wouldn't you just say, well, Brown was fine on the right, just run behind him on the right? Well, if you want to boot off of that, for a right-handed quarterback, it's hard for him to start towards his right, turn around, then have to flip his shoulders and yep. make a throw deep down the field. If you're if you're running, if your running back is running at, off the ass of the left tackle, and you're booting off of that for a right-handed quarterback, it's much easier to roll out or just turn around, see your target, and fire. And, yeah, and I wonder if that is at all a part of this this switch. Which shoulder is upfield? Yeah, if you're if you're running right, we're running this way. You're the defender. I'm running this way, and I have now turned it. If I'm going to turn around this way, I have to do a 360 to get back to set. If I'm running this way. Here I come. Or you at least have there to you just, you'd have to you'd have to do some you know there's a a little bit more of a the labor pivot jump back flipping that you have to do and and I know this from talking to coaches that that run this style scheme that have turn said, back. it's really valuable to have a quarterback this is one of the reasons why I think in Minnesota they like Kirk Cousins still he's pretty good pretty good at rolling to his opposite shoulder flipping his hips flipping his shoulders and making an accurate throw and that's a tough thing to find and so i just I you know do it. That, that may be reading too much into it it might also be tom with michael wenu at right guard and trent brown at right tackle you've got like you know 750 pounds of human on that side every time there's an obvious running situation every time it's third and one or fourth and one who who does the opponent think you're running behind probably behind behind the two behemoths that you have on your right side of your offensive line. So maybe moving Brown to the left, we know he can do it. Number one, but maybe <clears> moving him to that side makes them less predictable in those situations too. obvious run. Now we don't know if they're running behind big Mike or big Trent. That, that might be part of the, the decision-making process there too. All right. So that's going to be something to monitor really not this week, but in the first week of training camp, see where those guys are positioned. Um, we hit the coaching staff. We hit the offensive line. We hit some of our theories on what we might be looking at. Play of the day had to be the throw from Mac Jones to Trey Nixon. Kind of an over route, over the shoulder, near the left sideline, over Jonathan Jones, dropped in perfectly. Mac Jones had a really good day accuracy-wise. Later on in some of the seven-on-seven and the more competitive stuff, he was throwing behind guys for a little spate of throws. I don't know if you caught that as well, Phil, but – um, we saw that. We saw a nice catch by him. We saw Nikhil Harry get bumped out of a number of drills and sent down to the scout team. He'd be lining up, and they'd tap him on the shoulder. And go, Actually, you're out. So a tough day for them. Tough scene. Tough scene. Yeah, not, not and what you're looking for. Offensively, Phil, you, you thought it was choppy, choppy there at the last uh, portion of practice. Yeah, well, I just thought, yeah, late in the practice, where, again, that's usually – the most competitive part of practice. And this was again, when Bill Belichick was kind of relaying the plays to Mac Jones, it just felt sloppy to me. There was a, uh, a, a snap, I believe where Mac Jones would have been sacked. There was another one where he, he was pressured and tried to scramble. Nothing really came of that play. There was a throw behind Nelson Aguilar. It's hard to tell. Did Aguilar run a bad route or was Mac just inaccurate on that one? but they ran four or five plays in a row where they really got nothing at all. There was no completion. There was, there was nothing. Uh, and that included the, the last play that we already talked about where um, Terrence, is that right? Yeah. Terrence Mitchell knocked it out of Nelson Aguilar's hands. So that part to me was, was very choppy, but I'm, I'm looking at the stats and I'm not, I won't keep track of passing stats the way that I will during training camp. I, you know, I do like to do it during training camp. Springtime is a little early for me, but We appreciate those that do because I didn't realize I knew Mac Jones had an accurate day throwing down the field. Zach Cox, our buddy from Nesson, had him 14 for 14 and seven on sevens um, and 11 for 12 and 11 on 11. That's 
you know, even for practice, that's pretty good. You're, you're completing 25 of 26 passes uh, with a, with a defense out there and, you know, trying to bat the ball away if it can get its yeah. hands on it. So. Playing 70% competitiveness. They're not running right. through you, but they're trying to, they're trying to get their hand. What do they call that? The catch cage. What do they call that? The pocket. Sure. The catch, the catch point. No, the pocket. They call the it pocket something. In the pocket. Anyway, uh, did I miss anything? Have we missed anything? We've been talking for about 20 minutes here, going over the practice. Jake Bailey hit some absolute missiles. Um, <laughs> Jack Jones was out there a lot, the rookie cornerback, I thought had a noteworthy practice, just that he was active. Um, anything else jump to you, Phil? Um, I would just say two things as it relates to the receiver position. So Kendrick Bourne wasn't there today. Right, thank you. Everybody else was excused if they weren't there, which I don't think was, anybody else was. Was Bourne not excused? Do we know? No, Bill made it sound like everybody was excused. I oh, okay, I see. Uh, that's what you're saying. So, um, Trey Nixon got early reps with the offense, which surprised me a little bit. Um, Ty Montgomery also got some early reps with the offense. There was a little bit of confusion on Montgomery's part at one at one point. Mac Jones hit. J.J. Taylor sort of up the seam. There's almost a bad collision between Taylor and Montgomery right as the ball was getting there. Montgomery pretty clearly ran the wrong route. Like you would just never see that kind of spacing um, in any offense. Two players that close together. And Mac Jones got after, you know, while the most the majority of the offense was celebrating a, a long touchdown to J.J. Taylor, uh, Mac Jones kind of got after Ty Montgomery a little bit and kind of acted out the route that he was supposed to be running. There's another point in time where, you know, Mac Jones kind of threw his arms up in the air. It seems like there was a botched sort of um, snap count. So I thought he showed ownership of what he was supposed to be doing out there again today. But as far as the receivers go, Trey Nixon and Ty Montgomery saw early work. Uh, I also would say on Tyquan Thornton, who caught a couple of underneath routes, nothing deep yet from him in the competitive periods. Uh, but he did function as a gunner, Tom, on the punt team. And mm. I saw him catch one right out of the sky on the fly from Jake Bailey, uh, right around the goal line, which got a good good roar from his teammates that were involved in that special teams period. So really interesting to maybe see him as a gunner. I just he's so thin, Tom. It's a little I know. jarring, and it's it it would be hard to envision him tackling someone. But as a speed guy to just down a punt in a situation like that, that would make some sense to try to use him that way. Yeah, I mean he he would get thrown into the Gatorade pretty quick if he was not able to elude it. Um, but that's for another day. Look. Get some protein shakes in him. He'll be uh, burly as hell. Get some sand in his pants. He'll be ready to go. Speaking of sand in his pants, that's Phil Perry. I'm Tom Curran. And Phil will be back out there tomorrow. Phil, wave to everybody. Other hand. What happened there, Jesus? What are you trying, <laughs> trying to do to me? So this is pretty gross. We should not say for work. little warning on oh, that. Oh, folks, this is a podcast. Phil has a tremendous blemish on his uh, left palm. We're going to really be driving people to YouTube because between your <laughs> quarterback rollout reenactment and my Tommy. hand situation, I just fell. I guess I'm old now. I just went for a run and I fell like a jackass. Well, as long as you didn't break a hip, that's a good sign you're not completely old. You're just maybe no. your equilibrium is drying up. All right, speaking of dried up equilibriums, John Henry will put this thing out and it'll be in your mailbox in no time at all. Bye. <laughs>